Good morning, I'd like to welcome you to the Mendoza College of Business. Today we are delighted to welcome Dr. Marina Brozovich uh, to the University of Notre Dame to listen to her talk titled, Humans versus Asteroids, Mitigating Risk and Expanding Opportunities. Marina Brozovich is a physicist in the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology. She is a radar scientist and an orbital dynamicist from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Dr. Brozovich observed hundreds of near-Earth asteroids with the Goldstone and Arecibo planetary radar, and she was involved in the discovery of a dozen binary and three triple asteroid systems, 14 moons of Jupiter, and several trans-Neptunian objects. A main belt asteroid, 7295 Brozovich, is named after her. Her research involves orbital dynamics of the moons of the outer planets. She has also worked on NASA's New Horizons mission to the dwarf planet Pluto as a part of the Hazards team. She received her undergraduate degree in physics at the University of Zagreb in Croatia and her PhD in physics from Duke University. She spent several years at Caltech as a postdoc before joining JPL in 2007. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to Notre Dame campus and to the Mendoza College of Business, Dr. Marina Brozovich. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I was just telling Jim that uh, during, when I was a grad student at Duke, I actually spent four and a half years uh, living in Batavia, Illinois, which is just across the lake from you guys. Uh, because I was doing research in the uh, Fermi uh, National Laboratory. So it's always, you know, great for me to be back um, in Midwest. And, you know, despite I do not miss the weather, I have to tell you today uh, Los Angeles has 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's begin. I know that you had a talk on asteroids last week, but, you know, I still hope that I'm going to add some more uh, information to this. So what you're seeing here is how the solar system, our knowledge about number of objects in the solar system looked 40 years ago. We knew about um, less than 10,000 objects in the main belt. So this is this blue swath of little dots that represent asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. And we knew about 50 near-Earth asteroids. So those would be the little yellow dots closer to Earth. And near-Earth asteroids, they used to be main belt objects, but um, under the gravitational influence of Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars, and over the millions of years, they ended up migrating into the uh, near-Earth space. So you're going to see how our knowledge about the number of objects grew in the past 40 years, because NASA started to invest significantly um, in the discovery of asteroids. You'll see them flash white as, as, they, as they're being discovered. So in 40 years, we went from knowing less than 10,000 objects in the main belt. Now we know more than 1 million. And from knowing 50 near-Earth asteroids to now we know 29,000 of them. And we also know that about 8% of these near-Earth asteroids are something we call potentially hazardous. Now that is kind of loaded term. Um, potentially hazardous just means that um, something is large enough and may potentially come close enough to Earth that we need to pay attention. But the good news is that so far we haven't found anything that we should worry about, but we also know that many more objects need to be discovered out there. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good idea to kind of keep vigilant. Um, and so we are coming closer to today um, you see many objects. Uh, what always fascinates me is if you were to sum up all the mass of all these objects in the main belt, this blue, uh, you would end up only at 1 25th mass of our moon. So there's a lot of empty space there, despite kind of looking uh, quite a crowd. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about the event that kind of started it all, that really uh, kind of pushed NASA into discovering the Earth asteroids. And this was impact of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter. This was in uh, 1994. And in 1993, uh, this comet was discovered by Carolyn and Jean Shoemaker and David Levy uh, by 40 centimeter telescope at Mount Palomar. Uh, what was unusual about this object, it wasn't just a single object. It was this string of objects. And very quickly it was realized that this was a comet that 
was captured by Jupiter, and it was orbiting Jupiter for a good 10 years before it kind of made a really close flyby to Jupiter in 1992. Um, and Jupiter has this very powerful gravity field, and the tides just ripped the comet apart. And initially, this was already quite a large body. This was about a mile-wide comet. And what really made this event extraordinary was that a year later, in 94, all these pieces were about to slam into Jupiter. So, you know, all observatories were on deck. Uh, Galo spacecraft at the time, it was on its way to Jupiter. We had Hubble Space Telescope was monitoring. Uh, we had large ground-based telescopes were also observing this event. And it was really, it was spectacular because um, each one of these objects impacted it uh, over a period of week. Um, and the plumes in atmosphere were like thousands kilometer high. And the, and the temperature of this impact spot would reach like 50 to 70,000 kelvins. So uh, very dramatic events. And then they would leave these very dark scars that you see at the bottom. Um, and then Jupiter winds would end up kind of erasing them. So um, if something this large, so something a mile wide, would impact Earth, this would be a really bad day on Earth because so much dust and material would be kicked up in the atmosphere that would blanket the planet and significantly reduce the sunlight, which would affect plant life. And then potentially it would you know, trigger a chain reaction with animals and, and humans. And this is really what, uh, you know, Congress in 1994, Congress uh, tasked NASA to discover, characterize, and catalog near-Earth objects. By objects, I mean both asteroids and comets that are larger than one kilometer within a decade. So because anything larger than one kilometer, so it's got 0.8 miles or something, um, it is thought to be... Um, it could have global consequences. And then there was addition in 2005, there was this Georgie e. Brown Jr. Uh, Near Earth Object Survey Act. It tasked NASA to find 90% of uh, near Earth asteroids larger than 140 meters by 2020, because um, it's considered that everything larger than 140 meters can have at least severe regional consequences. But then in 2010, there was another study um, it was by a National Research Council, and that report found that really not enough money is invested uh, to reach these con two congressional mandates to complete them. So ever since 2010, NASA uh, was receiving significantly more funding to search for asteroids. And um, I can't believe I'm showing you org chart. I, I think this is the very first time I'm showing an org chart in my talk. Um, but I, I, th I think it's very informative. This is how Planetary Defense Coordination Office at NASA is organized. It is covering a lot of activities. So um, at, at the head, the Lindley Johnson, he's running the office uh, with the help of uh, Kelly Fast and Mike Kelly. So this program is funding a number of telescopes that are dedicated to, observe, to actually discover asteroids. And then they're also funding uh, this uh, minor planet center. Um, so that is kind of clearing, clearance house. The, the, every old data, all positional data of discovered asteroids um, come to them. And this is not just from NASA telescopes. It's coming worldwide and it's coming from many amateur astronomers that are significantly contributing to this you know, task of finding all the asteroids. And um, so Minor Planet Center kind of decides what's good data, what is not. It puts it out in public. And then NASA, um, our uh, Center for Near Studies at JPL, uh, pulls it and does a um, more detailed orbital analysis. So Minor Planet Center already does preliminary orbit, but uh, CNEOS uh, does a detailed orbital study. And they also look at any potential impacts. And what is currently happening, this Planetary Defense Coordination Office, is finally it's funding its own space missions. So the very first mission called DART, and I'm going to say a little bit more about uh, that one later, it's already out there in flight. And then after DART completes, uh, they're going to fund a space telescope called Enio Surveyor. And that is going to be an infrared telescope that is going to be dedicated to the discovery of asteroids and it's going to be very, very powerful. And finally, we're going to move uh, toward completion of the task that Congress gave to NASA. So this office also is uh, funding these kind of 
follow-up characterization facilities. One of those is planetary radar that I happen to work with. Uh, we have Goldstone planetary radar in Mojave Desert, California. And uh, there used to be Arecibo planetary radar in Puerto Rico until the observatory collapsed in uh, November of uh, 2020. So um, it has international partnerships uh, with the uh, United Nations, with offices such as uh, United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, and it also works closely with FEMA, obviously for potential disaster management. So how are we doing after 30 years of investment in searching for asteroids? These are kind of results. So the top and bottom plots are really your first and second congressional mandate. First congressional mandate finding all the near Earth uh, asteroids larger than one kilometer. So this is from by year how many objects were discovered. And you see that it starts slow and then a lot of them are discovered each year. And at this point we're just kind of finding a handful of them. And regarding the um, second congressional mandate, so finding 140 meter asteroids or larger so that bottom plot, you know, again, starts slow and then really ramps up, and we are still at the steady pace of discovering about between 450 to 550 objects every year. So how do you know that you're, that you're done? How do you know that your survey is complete? And uh, we always like to tell a fishing story, of all things. So um, it goes something like this. So imagine you come on a lake, you start fishing, you have no idea how many fish are in the lake. So you start catching fish, and you tag them, and you release them, and you catch all kinds of stuff. You catch large fish, medium fish, small fish. All are released. So sooner or later, depending on the size of the population, you're going to start recatching previously tagged fish. And that is going to happen, you know, you, very quickly you're going to realize uh, how large your population is. And this works for asteroids. You know, we have models that um, have certain, you know, numbers of asteroids in various orbits. You know how well your telescopes uh, are discovering these asteroids, so you know your efficiency. You run one model against the other, and if you're on the right track, you will be reproducing correctly how many objects each year you're supposed to discover. So we know that this first con congressional mandate, this task is more than 90% complete, which is really good news. Those are um, asteroids that would have global consequences if they were to impact. So, so far we know 881 of them, and we definitely know there are um, several dozens that still remain to be discovered. And then regarding this population 140 meter to one kilometer, um, so 140 meters, well, just multiply everything by three to get it in feet. Um, so that one, that survey has a way to go. Um, it's estimated that the total population is about between 20 to 25,000 objects, and we have found so far 10,000 of them. So about 40 to 50% complete. And you may wonder, well, what about smaller objects? And something smaller than 140 meters. So um, Earth's atmosphere is very efficient of protecting us for anything larger, for anything smaller than, sorry, 30 meters. Um, so, because at 30 meters, they are just going to, you know, harmlessly have an air burst uh, very high up in the atmosphere, and they will cause very little or no ground damage, unless it's metallic. 30 meter metallic asteroid can reach ground. But then around, you know, 50, 60 meters, even the stony objects can penetrate so deep in the atmosphere that the uh, outburst and the pressure wave is going to cause a very significant damage at something, say, a city size. So we definitely, they're also potentially hazardous. So things between 50 to 140 meters, at a city level, uh, they're pretty serious. Uh, so, and we have a lot more work to do in finding those. Um, that, that survey is, is not very complete. But, um, you know, luckily um, we, so the, the last significant event, so the significant impact that happened, um, this movie is playing here. This was an impact of a small asteroid. It was about 17 to 20 meters in size, so about 60 feet. And this one impacted in 2013 over uh, Chelyabinsk city in Russia. Um, it had disintegrated, it did air bursts at about 22 kilometers in the atmosphere. There was this huge fireball. Uh, but then the uh, pressure wave that came after the flash 
really ended up causing, and I have it muted, um, ended up causing a, a damage on some buildings and shattered glass. And this was kind of, you know, people would see flash in the sky, they would come out to see what was going on. And then there comes the pressure wave and shatters windows. So there were actually 1,600 people were injured from the glass. So, so kind of reminds us that even something uh, really small um, can have uh, kind of, you know, still consequences. This happens maybe every, um, this, the estimate frequency of these impacts is maybe once every several centuries. So let's, uh, yeah, the, there's some footages here. A lot of cussing in Russian. Apparently, it's important to scream both ways. <laughs> They're all fine. Yeah, I just hope that uh, everybody's out before these guys started walking on top. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it was it was it was a very dramatic event, and and um, you know, luckily, as I said this the events like this uh, happen maybe um, every several centuries, but we get hit by small things like really kind of something car size or smaller all the time, and we got hit just uh, less than a month ago. Um, this was a very small asteroid called 2022 EB-5, and it was discovered two hours before it was going to impact. And it was discovered by an amateur astronomer in Hungary. Uh, there's a very nice interview with him in space.com a couple of days ago, if you want to read. Um, so he was, again, he, was, he reported his measurements. He was seeing this you know, bright speck of light uh, moving across stellar background, did not correspond to the any known asteroids. He sent his measurements to Minor Planet Center. Minor Planet Center you know, put it on this list of real objects. Uh, JPL, Center for Near Earth Studies, you know, all this is automatic software. Picked up the measurements, um, started, we, there is this um, um, software called Scout that is do exactly searching for these things, imminent impacts and immediately started sending like a flurry of emails. Uh, it was daytime in, in, uh, in North America. Um, so it was exactly around lunchtime because I had like 40 emails over a 30 minute period. Um, so, um, so there were T minus 56 prior to impact. Um, there was this uh, swath of blue that was the corridor where it's going to be airburst. We knew it was extremely small, but, and we knew it was going to be just, you know, atmospheric impact. And then, you know, a lot of flurry, a lot of people started observing, more measurements came in, so the corridor shrunk a little bit more, and then with T minus 18 minutes to impact, it was really pinpointed that this is going to impact south of uh, Jan Mayen Island, that is territory of Norway. <laughs> the thing is that nobody lives there. There's apparently one research station, so, so there was really nobody to call. Uh, but uh, fireballs were, was observed from the, from the coast of, uh, from Iceland, apparently. And this is only the fifth asteroid so far, the small one, that we managed to find prior to impact. But this is a good news because this means all this, all this machinery that was put together by you know, PDCO uh, in NASA is, is really working. And if you want to see more impacts, um, kind of, the, this is on our uh, JPL website. So you see all the fireballs, poke, you know, that impacted um, Earth in the past 34 years. The size of the circles means, you know, uh, smaller impacts, and blue is smaller impact. The big red dot that was that Chelyabinsk impactor. It was about 440 kilotons uh, energy released, and then you see that light green uh, above Iceland, that was this recent impact, it was 100 times less 
um, events produce uh, 100 times in, uh, less impact. So, okay, I think we're done. We're talking about risk, and now we're going to switch and talking about opportunity. I'm sure you maybe read in newspapers or maybe heard last week um, something about, you know, that the future of uh, humans when we are going to one day be mining asteroids for water, uh, for uh, platinum group metals, and for rare earth elements. So, um, you know, how close are we of achieving this? And there's this really nice artistic impression of how this is going to look like. Um, my personal opinion is that it's not happening in the next 10 years. Uh, we came a long way. We, we, we know to do a lot of things. But uh, you know we know um, you know we know how to uh, travel to asteroids and how to uh, navigate spacecraft in this very low gravity field of an irregularly shaped object, um, and we know even how to take samples. But any mining uh, mining operation is going to have to take all this by you know orders of magnitude, scale it up by orders of magnitude. So. Um, here is like a family portrait of all the asteroids that were visited by spacecraft. And here it's not just NASA spacecraft. This is from other space agencies as well. And every single mission really pushed the boundaries of our technology and knowledge. Um, so we learned you know, how to do asteroid flybys. We learned how to orbit an asteroid, how to do soft landing, and how to take sample and even bring it back to Earth. So we learned a lot, but not quite there yet. So um, one technology that was developed uh, for exploration of the small bodies was uh, ion engine. So uh, the most traditional engine is the you know, chemical, it's, it's, a, it's a chemical engine. So basically you have some kind of chemical propellant, could be liquid or solid. There is a chemical reaction, there's a combustion, and out comes the hot gas and pushes your spacecraft forward. So that's the standard model. But um, ion engine is using something else. It's using um, electric field to accelerate ions of uh, xenon gas. And so you have this hot plasma coming out, and that is now what is pushing your spacecraft forward. Uh, ion engines are very efficient. So you need to carry much less fuel uh, to, to reach your destinations but they are kind of slow. You, it takes you, takes you a long time to accelerate, and then once you're halfway there, you have to start kind of slowly accelerating. Um, but, um, you know, with the chemical engine, is just kind of boom, and you go. Uh, so, but still, this was, this was incredible technology, and it was pioneered by Dawn spacecraft that ended up uh, exploring these uh, two big main belt guys. This is one series and two Vesta, so two largest objects in the main belt. So Dawn first traveled for four years and went into orbit about uh, asteroid Vesta. So this was not such a long time ago. This was, you know, 2011, 2012. So this was, this was recent. And this was the first time that a spacecraft was orbiting a main belt object. And then the, it fired up its ion engines and traveled another three years to Ceres and spent three years mapping uh, the series surface and understanding understanding this object. So um, not only do we know at this point you know how to do flybys and how to orbit asteroids, we also know um, how to land and take a sample. And um, Japanese space agency called JAXA uh, had already two sample returns. So the first one was called uh, Hayabusa 2 spacecraft was called Hayabusa 2 and it visited this what looks tiny little asteroid called Itokawa. It's about 500 meters in size and returned a, a really tiny sample, uh, much less than one milligram. Um, and then there was a more recent mission by JAXA to this asteroid called Ryugu. Uh, this one is, uh, this one is uh, 900 meters in, in, in diameter, so uh, you know a little bit more than half a mile. Um, actually, quite a bit more. It's about two thirds of a mile, and um, so not only did they spend uh, a year orbiting the asteroid, and they had a whole suite of science instruments. Um, they also managed to uh, land two rovers, one lander, 
They managed like, to slam a copper projectile into it and make a crater. Then they deployed the little camera that was observing everything, and they landed down and picked a sample and came back. So they, you know, they threw everything but the kitchen sink on that asteroid. And uh, the sample is back. It was back in December of 2020, and the spacecraft that was also using iron engines is still very healthy, has a lot of propellant, and is off to go to, to visit two more asteroids. And uh, NASA also had a sample return mission. It was called OSIRIS-REx. And it was visiting this uh, little spinning guy here, Bennu. Bennu is about a third of a mile wide. Uh, looks like a very close, little slightly smaller cousin of Ryugu. And this is kind of one object, you know, that it teaches you to expect the unexpected. Uh, because when, when OSIRIS-REx approached the asteroid, they were looking at some of the roughest terrains they could, anybody could imagine. Um, so this was kind of, you know, boulder and, and, and rocks and, and more boulders. And you have this sampling mechanism that is expecting pebbles and dust. So um, they spent a um, good two years orbiting it. And another thing they realized, they realized that this little guy is throwing rocks at them. So it, is, it was an active asteroid. So we, you know, we expect from comets to be active. They have a lot of volatiles, they heat up by the sun, there goes you know, dust and pebbles fly off. We also know some asteroids know to be active, but nobody expected that Bennu is active. So um, truth to be told, all these pebbles that it was launching, they, it, they were small and the collision would be relatively soft collision, but you still, you know, every once in a while you would see something goes a little bit faster and you don't want your spacecraft to accidentally get hit. But still, you know, uh, after two years in orbit, um, OSIRIS-REx had a soft touchdown on uh, Bennu, collected uh, at least 60 grams. That was kind of their, uh, that, that was their kind of level, what we call level one requirement, at least 60 grams of material. Um, and it was kind of, the, the little cup was overflowing, so they probably got more than that. And they are now on their way back to Earth. So they should be back uh, to drop off sample in September next year. And they'll be, off they go, to extended mission. So um, I don't have time to go into details about all the kind of neat stories about other missions. But I hope that this kind of illustrates that, that we did a lot in the past, in this past uh, 10 years. But all said and done, I mean, all these missions are, you know, very expensive. They take a long time to complete. So the sample return um, it takes, you know, six to seven years just from the moment you launch. Uh, I'm not even talking about building a spacecraft. And so far, the largest sample is going to maybe be um, 60 grams, that's equivalent of like a third of a cup of sugar. So we returned very little. So again, um, if you were to have profitable mining of asteroids one day, we, we, we need to develop a lot more uh, technology. Next 10 years, uh, these are some of these, uh, I'm, I'm putting the, these are NASA missions to small bodies. MB stands for main belt objects, NEA stands for near Earth asteroids. Uh, this is not a complete list, these are their arrival times. So the years you see, this is the arrival time on the object. And uh, you know, just now NASA is doing proposals for objects that are going to be launching um, that are toward the end of the decade. So there are going to be a lot more. And the other space agency, um, I know at least four missions that are going from uh, other space agencies. So we are, again, we are, going to, we are going to continue to pushing this technology development and pushing our knowledge about asteroids. We are going to try a new mode of transportation, new mode of propulsion. This is this uh, spacecraft called NEA Scout. So this one is not going to be using chemical rocket or, or uh, ion engine. It is going to be using a light sail. Then we, are, we have a Janus mission, uh, that one we have kind of small sets doing big science. Uh, you have two twin spacecraft, each one size of a, um, your carry-on bag, uh, that um, they have kind of just a basic set of instruments, uh, visible and infrared camera, and they will fly by uh, two asteroids and collect the data on them. Uh, then we have a any surveyor that is that's, uh, that's um, directly funded by Planetary Defense Office. It is going to be space telescope uh, that is supposed to, you know, it's going to be very efficient discovery machine and it's going to find a lot of asteroids and help us complete 
those congressional uh, mandates. And finally, uh, the uh, Psyche mission. Psyche is going to um, explore, it's arriving, uh, it's going to launch this summer. It's arriving at asteroid in main belt called 16 Psyche. And the mission is called also Psyche. Um, it is going to be orbiting metallic asteroid. Uh, it's 220 kilometers in size, so it's huge. And it is metallic and anybody, so again, um, Anything we think about, you know, future, future asteroid mining for platinum group metals, we're going to learn a lot um, from a science study of a 16 Psyche. And finally, just a, a few words about the DART mission. This is a, um, this is a, a first planetary defense mission. Um, its objective is not science. It really is going to add another activity toward um, our list of possible interactions with asteroids. This one is going to change its orbit. So um, the target is asteroid called Didymos. And it's not one object, it's two. So you have a large primary, it's about 760 meters in size. And then you have a smaller satellite, about 160 meters. And that one is orbiting the primary uh, with about 12 hour period. And the idea is that you have this spacecraft, you know, 600 kilograms going at 6.6 .6 kilometers a second, slamming into that satellite and changing how it orbits the primary. And you're going to see that change. They're expecting at least 10 minutes uh, change in this orbital period that is at the moment 12 hours. So, um, so, so you know, definitely a neat mission. Another thing I want to mention is that it was very fast. The timeline for this mission was super fast. It was launched last September on Falcon 9 and, um, or I think Falcon Heavy. And here we go, a year later, this September, it's going to impact. So it was launched November. Anyway, so, so incredibly short timeline. I, I keep telling you that all these timelines are you know, six, seven, eight years. Suddenly you have something happening within a year. And um, here is a, uh, this is NEO Scout. I told you this is a new mode of propulsion. It is a light sail. It's been, it's been tested in flight. In space flight, it's been, it's been tested, but just as a technology demonstration. This is the first time that it's going to kind of go and reach, be used to actually reach an asteroid. And it is going to be a tiny spacecraft. It's going to be six unit CubeSat. So uh, one unit for CubeSat is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. So about this. And the... Uh, the solar, the, the light sail, uh, it works on the principle, basically that radiation pressure from the sun. So the photons, they're you know, hitting this mirror and providing the impulse. So that's, that's the principle. Um, so the entire solar sail is fit into um, two units of CubeSat and the rest of them, about four units, it's, it's, a, a material, it's the other payload, the science instruments. It will take about two years uh, to get to destination asteroids. They're launching this summer. Um, and the asteroid is going to be very small. It's going to be only 20 meters, so 60 feet, something the size of a Chelyabinsk impactor. So it is the smallest asteroid that we are really going to see from uh, close by. And uh, um, a lot is happening with the launching, with, with, the, with the new rockets that are going to be launching uh, future missions. So every major player in town has a new rocket coming up, and all of them um, are, you know, much more, you know, more powerful, and um, they have a, um, you know, they'll be able to be launched more frequently. So, for example, uh, NASA has their space space launch systems. This is in the collaboration with Boeing. So this is going to be a huge, uh, huge rocket that one can, t you know, carry between like 70 to 130 tons to lower Earth orbit, depending on the configuration. And it is the one that is going to uh, return humans back on the moon and pave the road to eventually put humans on Mars. Then I have to mention um, SpaceX, and they have a Starship coming up. So, um, you know, Starship, prom ultimate promise for the Starship is that you will be able to launch 10 ton 100 tons to lower Earth orbit for less than $10 million. 
that would be that would be you know revolution, not evolution. But you know I expect nothing less from SpaceX. So um, and then also we have um, Blue Origins. They have a new Glenn rocket. That one is carrying will be able to carry 45 tons of payload into low Earth orbit. Um, and um, United Launch Alliance. You know, they have, currently have their you know, main Atlas V and Delta IV rockets are theirs, and they're coming up with this Vulcan Centaur uh, rocket. Um, so these rockets are supposed to be, the launches are supposed to, the, the price of launches is supposed to go da come down because um, all of these rockets, well, except SLS, are either partially reusable or fully reusable. That's why you know, SpaceX can start quoting um, you know, launch of less than uh, $10 million dollars and, and uh, you know, cadence of uh, very frequent kind of uh, uh, launches as well. So um, this is going to, this, this could potentially very much change, um, change the field. And what can they do, what, what will this all do for, uh, for space missions, exploration of asteroids? Uh, well, you know, you, you have, you can carry more fuel for, you know, more uh, uh, science instruments. Uh, you can definitely do much more stuff if, if suddenly the price of the launch vehicle comes down. Um, alternatively, since they have huge cargo bays, I mean, they can launch not only mass, they can launch volume as well. So you can, you know, you can see instead of launch, launching a, a two small sets to explore asteroids, you, you launch 100 of them. Um, so, so we could be looking at very interesting uh, next 10 years. The only thing is that uh, you can't just kind of keep launching things in space. Um, you need to have ground infrastructure. So you need to build um, a communication uh, with spacecraft because, you know, the onboard, um, onboard computers are not that smart yet. You know, AutoNav is not that, you know, you need to talk to them basically. You need to upload and download the data constantly. So uh, many more antennas um, will, will have to be built to support possibly a, in a large number of missions that could go up. And um, also, um, optical communication is 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 the next uh, next thing, so that you can the data transfer is still very low, and you will need to increase that in order to support uh, human spaceflight. So, um, so what's the next logical step in kind of moving toward a uh, mining asteroids one day? Well, you know, you definitely. Well, the logical step is that. Uh, the turnaround, uh, the missions have to be shorter in duration, they have to be uh, cheaper, which will they be because of all this uh, launch rockets that I, that I showed you. And you know, you'll have to be able to demonstrate that you can actually bring a, a, a larger sample, you know, I, something that is more that fits in a teacup in, in order to be profitable. So this reminded me kind of of a, um, there was a, there was a, a mission concept um, and that was kind of looked at by NASA um, starting sometimes in, in 2013 and ended in 2017, the administration change. Um, so the, um, the initial concept was really designed, there was, a, there, there was a workshop at Caltech where experts from the field spent kind of a couple of days together and came up with this um, kind of interesting concept for uh, version one version was called asteroid uh, redirect mission, and also the same one is asteroid retrieval and utilization mission. So, the bottom line was that you could, in version A, you would go to a very small asteroid, you know, something um, eight meters, eight to ten meters in size, so something uh, 20, 30 feet, and you would put it in a bag. You would first have to despin it because this is one one thing with a, with the small asteroids. They tend to spin really fast. So you can come up with something that is 10 meters, and it's 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 rotating like a 10 second period. So you first have to despin it and put it in a bag, and then drag it back to a stable lunar orbit, park it there, and then you can send uh, robotic and human missions and and you know use it as a technology test bed and 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 kind of really figure out your, your mining technology. The option, kind of the second version of this same mission was, well, let's not go and catch small asteroids, let's actually, these larger asteroids, they're full of boulders. So let's just go pick up the boulder and do the same thing. Um, you know, tow it into near Earth space where we can, um, you know, we can study it or, or um, you know, develop our technology in peace. And, uh, all this is, um, you know, all this is 
perhaps going to again be revived maybe from, from, from private companies um, in the next, uh, it, would be, it would be very kind of um, uh, logical uh, step because it would allow you, um, you know, um, to really get scale up and, and make that mining industry profitable. Uh, targets, what would be your targets? Well, maybe you heard about mini moons. So these would be, um, is, so far we know about two mini moons of Earth. And um, so these asteroids are really in orbiting, they're orbiting the sun in an orbit very similar to Earth. But then under certain set of dynamical conditions, they end up being temporarily captured around Earth in the Earth's gravity field, and they spend several months to several years orbiting Earth as opposed to the Sun. And um, so far we found two such objects. They, they were very small. They were like the size of a small car. But the models out there are predicting that um, at any point there should be something this big orbiting Earth. The good news is that they're really easy to reach. So you don't need to use much fuel. This will be a very quick, cheap mission to retrieve something. Um, but the bad news is obviously you have no idea what you're getting. Um, it's very small. You don't know about chemical composition. You don't know whether this is financially profitable. The, uh, but we don't have to kind of even wait for you know, these small mini moons. Um, this is the plot. I made this. So this is for the next 10 years. All the asteroids that are coming our way very close. So within several lunar distances. This is something we like to talk about. We like to talk about lunar distances. Uh, so that is distance from Earth to the moon. It's uh, 380,000 uh, kilometers or 240,000 uh, miles. Um, and um, so all this is going to be within reach, at least for a flyby um, with, with these uh, new rockets. So um, the, this one in 2029, Apophis, well, this one, I, I, it has its own slide. It's, it really deserves it. But you know, we're going to have a year before we have this. This is the kilometer size object, uh, 2001 WN5, that's coming within one lunar distance. We know it's optically dark. So this is probably um, carbonaceous chondrite. Uh, that means rich in hydrated minerals. That means water. Um, this, um, the, the sizes, I, I didn't mention that the size of the circle, so that's their size. Um, and uh, the color is how easy it is to get to them. So this is um, something in orbital dynamics called delta V. It's basically your fuel budget. Uh, blue color means good, cheap, you can get there easily. Yellow, mm, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit tougher to get to. But we have, a, we have a lot of things in blue. We have a lot of things in blue. And they are all within, you see, uh, a few lunar distances. So there will be a lot of opportunities to, to, to kind of further kind of develop our technology and to, to get the private, uh, private companies to, to actually figure out their business models uh, in space. And um, this is Apophis. So Apophis is uh, going to approach, um, actually, yeah, we can, Turn it a little bit down. So Apophis is going to approach within 4.9 Earth radii. That's 31,000 kilometers. On, fr on um, April 13th, which obviously has to be Friday, 2029. And um, it is going to come within the region of space where our you know, geostationary satellites are orbiting. Um, I just want to mention, you know, we know it's not going to hit. Uh, this object was discovered in 2004. We've been observing it for a very, very long time. A lot of measurements of its orbit. Um, it was very quickly excluded. You know, at the moment when it was discovered, there was this kind of very temporary uh, probability, collision probability of 4%, but that diminished very quickly after more measurements came in. And uh, just with radar, we observed it on three different, uh, three different, fly, uh, three different years. And most recently, we just observed actually last year, and there was still a very, very slim chance, you know, something one in gazillion um, chance of impact in uh, 2068. But then we pinged it with a radar, and radar is nice because it's very efficient. It kind of immediately, you know, tells you where it is as a distance, um, as, as a distance from Earth, and it very, very tightly constrains the orbit, and that was completely um, 
um, you know, that possibility is removed. And in fact, actually, we completely removed, um, JPL has something called a sentry list. And it's this um, automated software that is constantly recalculating impact probabilities. And Apophis used to be on the list, but now for the all foreseeable future, there are no more impacts, and I'm saying down to, you know, one in 100 million uh, cumulative. So it was, it's been completely removed. So in 2029, just, you know, look up, enjoy the show. It's going to be uh, as bright as the stars in a little dipper. So you're going to see it with a, with a naked eye. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be a whole slew of spacecraft visiting it. That's going to be like a traffic jam. Um, and not just by space agencies. This is going to be, I'm, I'm absolutely certain, it's coming so near, so close. Um, this is going to be um, private private um, companies as well. And I, I can even see it, you know, the uh, space tourists. I'm, I'm, I, I would not be surprised that, that you have some uh, space tourists snapping a, a picture of Apophis as it's, it's, coming, it's coming by. And whatever, you know, regardless of what you think of, uh, of a space tourism, um, I do think it's going to be, it already is, but with respect to asteroids, it's going to be profitable far before a asteroid mining operations become profitable. And I was trying to find kind of illustration of how a flyby, you know, what would you see from your window? And I think this is kind of a great example. So this was uh, the, uh, this is where the ESA, the European Space Agency had this uh, mission called Rosetta. And it was orbiting this comet called 67P churyumov gerasimenko um, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, and I'm a Slavic speaker. <laughs> um, so it's been two years orbiting it, and this is a compilation of all the images, and, and uh, it's a huge comet, you know, it's, it's, it's a seven kilometers, so it's much larger than anything that's coming our way. But, you know, even if the views are half as good, um, this, 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 would be, um, this would be so amazing to see. And um, I hope that if there is a space safari on uh, Apophis in the future, I hope they bring some science instruments as well, um, because um, this is more than just a, a pretty view. And, uh, you know, asteroids, they are, you know, remnants of the solar system formation, and we still have so much to learn. So I'm done. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Robin. Um, we have some a lot of time for questions here, so this is being recorded and live streamed, so we ask that the questions be use the microphone so we can capture those properly for those who are viewing remotely. So uh, Ashley here has some microphones. Um, who would like to ask a question? Oh, goodness, I have no questions on asteroids. That no one, never happens. No one ever likes to be first. Thank you. How you doing? Uh, just we had a speaker last week that was getting into the asteroid mining business. Uh, you said we were ten years away. Could you elaborate on that at all, and, and from your personal perspective? I, I didn't hear. Co what? Yeah, we had uh, someone in the industry, the mining asteroid industry, last week speak to the group. Uh, you said that your personal opinion was we're a decade away. Can you just kind of go a little further and kind of how you see that industry and kind of what your perspective is? Yes, yes, of course. Um, yes. Yeah, so basically, what is the uh, my perspective on uh, asteroid mining industry? As, as I said, the, the um, I think a lot is happening. The elements are there. Um, so we definitely, you know, learned a lot um, how to get to asteroids and how to interact with them. But um, everything is still, you know, very expensive, takes a long time. And um, just returning that sample uh, back to Earth, and initially you will have to, you know, the, the idea is that in the far future you, will, you won't have to drag everything to near or to, to like uh, within one lunar distance. You will just go to your um, fueling station in the main belt and off you go. So, uh, but that is not happening any, anytime soon, as I said, um, because the, uh, we still have to demonstrate that we can bring something more than a teacup um, back in, within one lunar distance. 
Uh, but, but definitely, you know, it's going to be great progress, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing what will the cheaper launch vehicles, what will that enable? Uh, because yeah, you can you can dream much more ambitious missions. Where you can you can dream, you can go with uh, heavier payloads. You can also bring back more, and you can bring more fuel, which means that you'll get to your destination faster. Because because the problem with the with the you know this kind of asteroid mining industry, you will have to invest. Yeah, you will have to invest so much money for the next 10, 20 years. You are not going to see profit for a long time because everything takes time. I mean, this is like. You know these NASA missions. They take they take hundreds of people, and they take many many years to complete. And then once even when you are uh, in flight, it takes you know six seven years uh, to 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 complete the objective. So you have to be ready for the long haul. So you have to you have to have really deep pockets uh, to to know that you are not going to make a profit from mining. Um, anytime soon, because you just you just don't you will not have that much that much sample. Um, but you know who knows maybe maybe um, um, there will be a way to um, perhaps um, you know um, start doing business with the data that you'll collect. Because there's no reason I'm 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 seeing that you know kind of probably the first ones to that the, the private industry is going to do they're going to start doing their own uh, flyby missions, so scouting missions, seeing what's out there. Um, and then, you know, they will, on a step two, they will start doing, um, they, they will try to mine something. And another thing I guess that I always like to say is the, um, so very often you hear this kind of, oh, this asteroid, metallic asteroid calls, you know, it, it, it's, it contains this many bazillion dollars of platinum and gold and it's going to crash the world markets and whatever. Well, first of all, metallic asteroids are really hard to, um, Diagnose to to know what is metallic uh, from Earth, you know, from with a with a with a ground-based um, uh, things without you know having a spacecraft to go there. Um, you know, you can look at their spectra, which are us usually very um, uh, ambiguous. So when something is so so you can be looking in in the same group in the same category, you can see something that is metallic. Or something that is very, very dark and contains, uh, you know, a lot of um, 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 carbon, uh, kind of carbon chemistry. Um, so, so yeah, the in near Earth population, I can tell you, I know two near Earth asteroids that are metallic, and I know their names. It's it's uh, 1950 DA, 1986 DA. So, so, you know, when I can pull out these random names out of my head, there are not that many of them. So we still have a lot of work to do with even kind of finding where to go, unless you are going to go to main belt, where it has some really huge, you know, metallic objects, but main belt is far away. I mean, when you go, if you're going to go and mine in main belt, then you have, you know, you have to deal with whole another thing. You are kind of halfway to Jupiter, um, you are, um, your return time is going to take a while. Um, you are working in, you know, time delay um, because you will be communicating with your spacecraft. You know, you send the command, and then things come back, um, and it's going to take like it can take an hour, um, definitely tens, many tens of minutes. So you'll be working in time delay. Uh, you will have to have much smarter auto na the the onboard navigation. So so computers that will have to be making decision in real time, um, because as I said, guidance from Earth is, is, is delayed. Everything, everything is time delayed. So, so I'm saying, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of, I was trying to, I was actually reading kind of a lot of things um, this past you know, couple of weeks and trying to make this in some kind of cohesive story of where we are now and what would be the logical steps in the next 10 years um, so that you know, we can maybe have first mining thing in the next maybe 20 or so. Um, and, um, and so this is, yeah, they, these were kind of some of my, as I said, my, my, my personal thoughts. Um, and I know your speaker, your speaker last week, that was Robert Jedeke from University of Hawaii. Um, yeah, he's, um, he definitely spends a lot of time thinking about uh, mining asteroids. Uh, I have to see the talk. I don't know whether I agree with him, but um, I, I haven't watched the talk any, yet, but I was kind of saying, yep, no, it's not happening. <laughs>
All right, hello. Okay, it's coming through. Um, you've spoken a lot about the long-term detection of asteroids. That being said, when you were speaking about the, um, the one that impacted near Iceland, Norway, that that was only found really two hours before impact. Now, of course, it's very, you said it was very small, and I, I assume that for larger asteroids, this wouldn't be as much of a hassle, but for, let's say, the lower end of the hazardous asteroids, like 140 meters or so, what's... What do you think is, say, the closest one could get without being detected? What kind of leeway would it look like in a worst case scenario? Yeah, so, um, yeah, very good question. I mean, you know, obviously we discovered so far only about 40 to 50 percent of population that are in this group, 140 meters to one kilometer. So there is a lot more work to be done. Um, we are, it's, in, you know, the reason why that impact over Russia surprised us so much, so 20 meter asteroid was because it came, you know, from the sun, from the daytime, from the sun side, and no telescope, you can't observe with telescopes during the daytime, you, you just can't find them. Um, so it's, it's kind of, that's kind of our, our blind spot, but um, those things happen very rarely, and the answer to that would be a space telescope, space infrared space telescope, like the one that uh, Planetary Defense Coordination Office is planning to launch in 2026. So um, that's an Enio surveyor, because Enio surveyor is going to be parked inner to Earth orbit, and, and it will be able to look much closer to the sun than any Earth telescope. In other words, it will be able to notice really a lot of objects, even if they're trying to sneak in. So, so that is going to be really the key of discovering these uh, potentially hazardous objects that we don't want to be surprised by. But um, having said that, you know, the thing is very rarely something just kind of sneaks up on us because we usually see it many times and we have some, some decent, we would probably have a, a warning time. This, it would not happen overnight. And... Um, and there is um, actually every, every couple of years, uh, there's something called Planetary Defense Conference um, that um, is organized by um, Astronautical Society and, and, and NASA and many other um, agencies. And this is really where people kind of exactly do these scenarios. You know, we all come to a conference and, and actually people from various fields. Um, it's, uh, you know, people that are, you know, doing science, people that are doing engineering, um, even people that are doing um, kind of politics and law. You have people from United Nations, from FEMA, and we have exercise. We have a scenario, you know, something is coming our way. You have this warning time. These are the type of measurements you can get. Uh, what are you going to do? And so there are these little working groups um, that are kind of deciding, yeah, okay, so which assets that we have, can we get more information on it? Then, okay, usually, well, let's send the, the scout mission and see what it is. And then, you know, finally there is deflection exercise. It's like, what kind of, what deflection, you know, mechanism, I, usually it's a kinetic impactor. You know, usually it's kind of, you try to slam something. Um, and, and, and there are other methods. So uh, these type of exercises are kind of actively happening and in order so that we can be kind of ready for um, any, you know, any, any surprises, which are, as, as I said, I, they're, they're highly unlikely, but, but they, they're being always considered. Hi, thank you again for your time. I was wondering if you could briefly speak to your opinion on like the Torrid meteor stream and the threat that that might possess, as I believe it was responsible for the 1908 impact in Tunguska. Oh, I don't think, I, I heard that. Uh, the Torrid meteor stream? Uh, Torrid, oh, Torrids. Um, yeah, I, I think that was, uh, I'm not sure that, uh, that there is enough information that you can connect. The Tunguska was obviously 1908. It was something even larger than 
uh, Chelyabinsk that impacted over Russia. It seems like all these big things impact over Russia. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, it was you know it was the, the information was um, scarce at that time. You know, you 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 have kind of this circumstantial evidence of the geometry in the sky that it came from, and then kind of from that geometry, you're trying to estimate, oh, it must have been in this kind of orbit around the sun, and based, then, or based on that, then you kind of try to correlate it with, uh, you know, with what was its parent body. Um, but, um, you know, it is, it, is, it is not something that is easily deduced. You just, you just don't have enough information to, to make any strong claims. But, but you can speculate. People like to speculate. So if a 140 meter asteroid was like gonna hit Earth, what would our playbook look like? 140 meters, that would be regional damage. So that would be, you know, something. So the um, impact craters usually scale factor of 20. So it would be a substantial size crater there. Um, so a lot of material uh, ejected in the atmosphere. Um, definitely, you know, um, 140 meters, well, a nice chunk on Europe uh, would suffer the consequences because the consequences are not, not just, you know, your direct, um, your direct impact and shock wave that will obviously devastate a huge region, but, uh, but you would also kind of probably have a uh, mini, um, very prolonged winter because of a lot of dust, so that means, you know, failed crops and, and, and everything that comes after. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm just saying, you don't even have to destroy a, a species. You can just kind of send us back to, I don't know, uh, Middle Ages or lower. You know, it's, the, the civilization is a very fragile thing. For, you know, we always think it's going forward. But you destabilize it with something like that. And you will have very, very, um, you know, complicated and serious serious consequences, and that is something that when we discuss uh, at these planetary defense conferences, we, we have people that are sociologists and you know, people in economy and business that have their take on what would happen and, and how would people deal. Um, you know, we always have these kind of interesting um, uh, discussions so you have something is coming our way, and the, uh, the, the, there is the uncertainty that is, um, um, it, we, we know, say we calculate, it's going to impact over this region of the world. And we have a plan for deflection mission, and what we are going to do, we, are go we have to push the asteroid, you know, we, we, have to, uh, uh, we have to adjust its orbit so that it misses Earth completely. But if we fail, this impact corridor is going to move over another region of the world. And are you willing to take, are you willing to go to your citizens and to your voters and say, oh, for the benefit of humanity, we need to be put in a risk. Otherwise, it's going to be hit, you know, like it's going to go somewhere else. But we are, otherwise, you know, if it fails, we're going to get hit. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting and very kind of complicated uh, discussion about, you know, how to, how to deal with these things. Hi there. Uh, my name is Malachi. Thank you so much for taking the time. You're clearly very uh, knowledgeable in this space. Um, in this series, we've fortunately had a number of women speak, which uh, I hope is indicative of a larger shift in the industry. Um, and I'm curious if there are people or policies in your life, in your career, that have helped make space for you. Um, and more importantly, as participants in a, another male-dominated industry, what can we do uh, to create more space for, for people like you? <laughs> Well, okay, well, thank you for the question. Um, the, um, yeah, I guess my take is, uh, I never kind of, um, um, I don't think, I come, you know, I come from, from obviously, I'm, I'm foreigner. I, I, I come from a, a, a different country, from a different culture, different school system, so, um, for me, being in sciences, and, and as I said, I, I was, you know, from the beginning of time, I was, I was always math-oriented, and that's what I like doing. And I apparently didn't get the memo that's supposed to be hard. 
So, um, so, so yeah. So it was something. You know, it was it was it was just a different. You know, I come from from very different educational system. At the t you, you just had to kind of you know math starts at seven, whether you like it or not. Uh, physics and chemistry start at 12, whether you like it or not. And we kind of all kind of understood like, well, I just have to do it. It's a part of my general knowledge and sure, I may be good in some things, I may not be good in some things and um, that's okay. Failing is absolutely fine. Um, I can, so, so it, was, it was kind of, you know, I think I have a little bit different perspective. Maybe I just don't know how to answer it kind of well in terms of I never went through, um, you know, I came here in grad school and that was already, you know, kind of, uh, Pretty, pretty. Um, you know, it, it wasn't. It wasn't the the events that shaped me. That you really start early, when when you're kind of going in sciences. Um, you, you start early, and so as I said, by the time I was in grad school, well, um, I never thought it was a big deal. Um, and um, yeah, I, I I do work. Um, women are still in aeronautical engineering, especially there are not that many of them, uh, but there are some, and the numbers are growing. So so. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a very good sign. I think that, uh, uh, you know, in general, I always say we need everybody in STEM. You know, we need, we need uh, not only people being in STEM and being in engineering and sciences, but we also need people, business people to support, you know, everybody kind of to kind of support that part of economy and that part of society. So, so, so I would say, you know, I always, I always like to, um, you know, talk to everybody in the audience. And, 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 and tell them how you know, the career in science and, and engineering is very rewarding because you keep learning all your life. Um, you, you meet some um, you know, very interesting people, um, some very interesting. And, um, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it, it never kind of, it, it never feels for me, it never feels like work. Which is which is which is really you know it's 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 not something that that many people can say so 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 yeah I think I think you know it was um, I just do things I don't think about them I just do it. So, if you were to ask a nuclear weapons expert today, um, they might say that we don't give enough thought to the concept of like nuclear war just as a society. Or if you were to ask a virologist before the COVID-19 pandemic, they might say that we don't give enough thought to the concept of a worldwide pandemic and that we don't have the infrastructure in place. Um, being an expert in asteroids, do you have this fear that maybe we're not prepared? Um, if we were to have something 140 meters across, um, would we even have the infrastructure? Like, what, what could we even do about it? Does that lend to the fear? Um, because you do seem like, you, you feel like this is unlikely, um, but I just wanted to know, um, like, your, your opinion. No, no, it's a, no, absolutely a good question. So as I said, you know, um, obviously, uh, funding for NEO discoveries has significantly increased uh, in the past uh, 10 years. Um, and but but we still didn't reach that um, you know goal of really kind of feeling completely safe because we there's so many objects out there. Um, so a, a good step is going to be this uh, launch of this infrared telescope. Um, so that is going to be definitely very important for um, you know for kind of overall safety. Um, could we have gotten there sooner? Yeah, I mean absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, regarding the second part of your question regarding um, whether we have technology for impact, well, you know, DART mission uh, is just uh, going to be hitting this a small asteroid and changing its orbit. So we are definitely actively testing kinetic impactors. Um, and so we, we do have a way, um, you know, we, we, we are heading in that direction when we are able to find everything we need to find and protect ourselves in the case we need to protect ourselves. And um, whether it's, you know, taking seriously in a society, you know, I think it is. I think there were polls um, in this country that showed that uh, the that, uh, public is very much supporting, uh, supporting, you know, um, uh, asteroid uh, science and discovery of asteroid. And, and that is something actually that they're very much, um, you know, sometimes, sometimes concerned. Um, it's good to be concerned, but I'm saying at the same time, you know, kind of, I would say like, you know, please listen to, you know, when, when um, uh, 
uh, when we say that you know something is safe because uh, we really keep that information is public, so um, uh, there is there is no um, there is no secret information. Uh, all the data are being reported to the Minor Planet Center, um, so the measurement data. Everybody that has any kind of orbit software can go and calculate orbit. Uh, there are many telescopes. Not, NASA is not the only one with telescopes. Everybody has telescopes. So, so I'm saying. So a lot of people are involved in this. Uh, uh, there is there is no need. <laughs> Or, or nobody's trying to keep any kind of you know, information secret. And actually, we are really trying to be very you know, transparent on anything that is coming. And you know, sometimes it needs to be very trivial. Some small object, like 10 lunar distances, but you know, there is a British tabloid that wrote a big article about it, and suddenly everybody's calling NASA, you know, do we have a comment? And then you, you say, yeah, there's a small asteroid. There is one much closer. <laughs> I don't know why they picked that one, but uh, you know, but uh, but uh, you know, it's so something is always coming around, and when media has slow news day, they know to pick up random asteroid and make it a big deal. So, so, um, but it's all good. Thank you for your time. So you mentioned that smaller objects are more likely to be detected late. So let's say we detect an object on the smaller range of something that can impact ground, like 50 to 70 meters. Um, late enough that we can't make it miss Earth, but early enough that we can make it hit somewhere else, like say the Pacific Ocean instead of Siberia. Mm. Do we, like I'm, I'm deliberately picking two unpopulated areas. Do we know, or what would be the, would it be better to hit the ground and have localized damage to the ground or create a giant tsunami? Do, do we know which one would create worse? And if that situation were to come up, what would we do? Yeah, um, yeah, good question. Yeah, so um, something on that order, uh, even larger, um, well, you would have to understand the impact geometry. Not all impacts are the same. So, you know, if you have the grazing impact, you have a lot of atmosphere to slow it down. If you have something direct, you have all that energy and all that pressure wave, you know, uh, um, causing far more damage. Um, it would be a matter of uh, uh, between, you know, there, there probably there would be United Nations would be involved, FEMA would be involved, you know, everybody in the world would be involved in that type of decision. Um, and, you know, it's on the simplest terms, if, if it's uh, damages so 50, 60 meters, that would be citywide devastation, you can evacuate. You can also do that. So, so you can do mass evacuation, and, and that would be one way to, to, to save people. Regarding uh, deflection into, um, into ocean, uh, we actually had one uh, exercise on a planetary defense uh, conference uh, I'm not sure exactly where it was at this point. Uh, what was it supposed to impact? Tokyo, maybe? Um, anyways, the, the point was that, yeah, the flexion was into the ocean. And it depends. There are models out there that are showing that tsunami would dissipate very quickly, which is a good news. So it depends how deep water is. It depends on exactly what is the kind of the, the sea bottom, how it looks like. So not everything is going to, you know, kind of generate tsunami. Um, and it does seem, it seems like always the damage would be, um, the damage would be from this uh, atmospheric impact and, uh, um, and, and the kind of pressure wave. And regarding the, the impact into the ocean, yeah, the, the, the odds are that it would dissipate relatively quickly. That's at least the last I remember from reading papers. That was, that was kind of a little bit, a little surprise, kind of a little surprise um, uh, discovery. All right, we have time for one more question. Hello, and thank you again. Uh, I see that there's a lot of thought and care put into the trajectory of all near-Earth objects and how they will impact Earth uh, specifically. But is there any additional thought or a need for any additional thought put into the impact of those objects on the cluster of satellites around Earth, specifically their trajectories around Earth and uh, if they might change at all? 
I, I couldn't. Uh, uh, could, you, could you please repeat one more time? But hold the microphone. Don't yeah, sorry. Uh, the impact of all the uh, external objects on the cluster of satellites around Earth and their trajectories. Oh. Okay. So, 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 yeah. So you're saying, well, what if? One of these uh, 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 asteroids, like Apophis, is coming within geostationary, you know, within ge ge geosynchronous ring of satellites. So, what if it were hit one of the satellites and and suddenly changes its orbit? Um, so, so yeah, there was there was there was a while back there was uh, there was some some some. Uh, there was a newspaper article on it uh, a while back. Well, it would be absolutely negligible because it's kind of you know like a, a, a fly landing on an elephant. Um, it, it is it is so tiny. I mean, it's it's the impact would 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 really not change the orbit in any significant way. I mean, this is these are massive uh, massive objects that are moving and incredibly fast. And so even some some you know the the the, the satellites are there like a few meters in size. Um, so, so yeah, it, it would. We we do not think that there would be any um, detectable consequences uh, for that particular, um, you know, that particular fly, close flyby, um, and you know, we um, whether something you know, a thousand years later, this little butterfly effect would have, you know, increased the impact probability some, you know, many centuries or thousands of years later. Well. You know that's uh, that's uh, that would kind of that would obviously be studied. Uh, that would obviously be studied. So, but but it, it's not something that we we would worry about. Dr. Brozovic, uh, on behalf of the University of Notre Dame and Doza College of Business, all our students, faculty, and staff, and our alumni and friends online, we'd like to thank you for coming out and sharing your. Uh, astute thoughts with us and insight and very entertaining talk as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.